Good evening, everyone, or good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from, where you're listening in from. Welcome. My name is Dr. Fort. I'm a physiotherapist here in the United States. I was born and raised in Zimbabwe, but I've been in the USA for 17 years. And for the last 13 or 14 years, I've been a physiotherapist. Um, Dr. Singh is also joining us. He's He and I are the founders of GEM, the Global Initiative for Expert Manual Therapists. And <clears throat> We're really happy to have you guys. This is our second of four um, free short lectures that we're doing um, for physiotherapists all over the world, anyone who wants to tune in. And, um, you know, our mission is to create better physiotherapists all over the world uh, for many reasons. One is we want people who have chosen to become physiotherapists to be able to learn. And the more you learn, I think the better physiotherapist you become. And I think you get more satisfaction out of your job and what you do. Um, certainly, we want better outcomes for patients who go to physiotherapy. Um, my vision is that physiotherapy becomes the one-stop shop for anyone who has a need of, you know, um, getting rid of pain or musculoskeletal issues. It's very possible that patients will do many, many, many things on the road to recovery. They'll try this thing, they'll try massage, they'll try chiropractic, they'll try acupuncture, hijama cupping, um, personal trainer, physiotherapy, surgeries, shots, injections, all of these things. When the reality of it is that physiotherapists are capable of being a one-stop shop. In other words, physiotherapists are capable of being the only place that somebody needs to go Barring, of course, that person needs surgery. If they need a surgery, they need a surgery. That's fine. But so we want to create physiotherapists that are well-rounded, that are holistic, that are evidence-based. Um, I like the term hybrid, like a hybrid physiotherapist. To me, that alludes to a physiotherapist that can do joint work, like chiropractic, osteopathic techniques. They can do Dry needling, which is Western medicine's version of acupuncture. There are times when that is very helpful, certain conditions, certain diagnoses. And then they can also diagnose musculoskeletal disorders and treat them effectively through strength, flexibility, and especially using regional interdependence and global movements. How does this patient move? And why do they move that way? And how do we fix that? And so we're going to get into a little bit of that today. We hope to show you guys this bigger picture. We hope to show you guys a glimpse of our vision. And hopefully you guys will enjoy the lecture and join us for our future lectures as well. So without any further ado, today we're talking about mysterious medial knee pain. And this is something that I enjoy teaching quite a bit. I've had many, many physiotherapy students, and I always love it when I have physiotherapy students and I get a patient that has mysterious medial knee pain. And we end up treating this pain at the back, at the pelvis, via the saphenous nerve, and the pain is gone. And it's really cool. It's a lot of fun. So that's what we want to talk about today, some case studies regarding mysterious medial knee pain. <clears throat> so again, myself and Dr. Singh, welcome, you guys. I'm going to show a short video. You guys can watch the video, and then we'll get going. I'll show the social media later. You guys can follow us if you would like. <clears throat> so mysterious medial knee pain. Let's talk about it. Um, just real quick, in case there's anyone who has not attended any of 
my lectures or our lectures before. Um, so in the USA, there all physiotherapists obtain a doctorate of physical therapy now, and that's post bachelorette. That's post bachelor's three years. After that, if you choose to specialize in a field of study, you can become a specialist after studying for some time and passing a very vigorous exam in which the first time pass rate is anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. It's quite low. Um, beyond that, you can attend a fellowship program like uh, Dr. Singh and myself. We've done that. And that's an additional two to four years of coursework, postdoctoral coursework. And working with the top of the top physiotherapists in the USA, spending 440 hours with them, um, having them scrutinize every decision, every hand placement, every technique, every exercise, every test. And so as far as, um, as, far as the quality of the content, I think we're bringing you guys the tip top. I hope that you'll enjoy the lecture today. Okay, so I'm going to present two scenarios. So you guys listen up. I love it when this happens. I walked into the clinic to treat a patient and this patient was not my patient. This patient has been seen by another physiotherapist that works for me, that is still learning. And um, I come to see the patient and I'm asking, how was your previous session? You're here for your knee. I see you had a medial collateral ligament sprain of your knee, grade two, about two months ago. And so I said, you know, it looks like you've got a great program. How is the program going so far? And the patient told me, I have severe pain still on the medial side of my knee. And he said, last session, the physiotherapist put ice and compression on my knee after the session. And it was very uncomfortable. I got some numbness and some tingling. And now my knee is hurting more. It's hypersensitive. Anything that just touches my knee, it hurts hurts a lot. Even, even if the air blows on my knee or if my pants touch my knee, it hurts a lot. So I said, okay, let's see what's going on. I think I know what's going on, but let's see what's going on. So we checked his MCL. I did MCL stress test by doing some valgus force at the knee with the knee in a 30 degrees of flexion. And um, there was a slight bit of pain but it did not reproduce the severe pain and the type of pain that the patient was describing. So what else is going on? So we did meniscus testing. The meniscus testing was negative. So I decided, ha, let's palpate the nerve that runs along the knee here, the, the saphenous nerve, which is a branch of the femoral nerve. And when you palpate a nerve that's cranky, that's unhappy, that's having issues, that nerve will be thickened and fibrotic, and it will be hypersensitive to the touch. And this is exactly what I found at this patient's knee. So when we palpated this nerve, he it reproduced the patient's symptoms. It was referring pain from his knee all the way down to his leg and his ankle along the medial side. <clears throat> and there was a palpable difference in the, in the saphenous nerve from the affected side to the unaffected side. So I said, right, we have important information. Now we're going to continue our evaluation, <clears throat> checking out the saphenous nerve and the regional interdependence that will be necessary to treat the saphenous nerve. Another patient. This is a great story. I've had at least two patients like this. Both of them I've had when I've had PT students, and it's super interesting. An older female, I'm talking like 70, 80 years old, an older female that says, I don't know what happened to my knee, and during the day, my knee is fine. I can stand up, I can sit down, I can do stairs, I can drive, I can do all of these things. But when I go to bed at night and I sleep on my side, when I go to bed at night, if my knees are touching each other, I cannot stand that. When, as soon as my knees touch, the pain comes and it's most severe. And it's, it's difficult because that's normally how I sleep. And, uh, and, and so she's struggling. So I said, right, well, that sounds very interesting. It sounds like the compression of the knees being together is irritating something. There's few muscles, there's a nerve there. Also in this patient, we palpated along the femoral nerve and where it branches into the, into the saphenous nerve above the knee and below the knee, we palpated. And that was reproducing the patient's pain. And we're not even palpating where the pain was, right? We're palpating proximal, to where the pain is and we're palpating distal to where the pain is. And that helps me confirm that it's the nerve that's involved and not some other structure that I could be pushing on locally. So I like to take advantage of that. 
So saphenous nerve is implicated. Question is now, what do we do about it? Right? So let's talk about, before we get into what are we going to do about it, let's talk about how can we get saphenous nerve, ANTT. ANTT stands for adverse neural tissue tension. Adverse neural tissue tension. What are some ways that the saphenous nerve can become irritated and, and give us symptoms and become thickened and fibrotic? So immobilization is one way that nerves and other tissues in the body can become unhappy. So if patient's in a cast, maybe a post-operative boot, maybe if the patient is non-weight bearing, we get decreased blood flow and perfusion to several tissues, the nerve included. Compression, compression to a nerve can certainly cause it to be irritated. Um, and the longer you compress the nerve and the more severe you compress the nerve, the more severe the symptoms and the, and the more chronic the symptoms can become. So th something like a knee brace, many patients wear knee braces of all sorts, right? To help deal with their knee pain and things like that. Some patients that have been in hospital or have diabetes or have uh, edema swelling in their legs, they'll wear compression, compression um, socks or garments, or maybe the patient is a little bit obese and things are not fitting well. And we get some compression either above the, above the knee or below the knee. And that can also irritate the saphenous nerve. If a patient is post-operative, and they've had some sort of knee surgery or a, a, a total knee replacement, a meniscectomy, an arthroscopy to the knee, um, the incisions and the portal sites um, can potentially generate swelling, inflammation, scar tissue, and things like that, where the nerve can become entrapped. Or if there is edema, the, the swelling can push on the nerve and compress it in that way. Um, and then again, after swell, after a surgery, you might be immobilized for a little while during the surgery, they'll wrap the leg very tightly. They'll put a very tight tourniquet around the leg. Why? To prevent the patient from bleeding out while they're, while their knee is opened for surgery. So the, the extreme compression that a tourniquet causes to the leg could potentially cause neurological insult, whether that's short-term or long-term. Not only the the um, not only the tourniquet, but you guys also have seen like the clamps where they have to grab the skin and pull the skin apart and keep it open like that. If you if you get the nerve compressed like that, the nerve can be be very symptomatic afterwards and give a host of symptoms from numbness, tingling, burning, shooting, anything. Um, and patients cannot always distinguish, you know, where the pain is coming from and stuff like that. So sometimes the post-operative dressings where the patient gets wrapped in ACE bandage, the ACE bandage can be too tight in one area or another. So <clears throat> let's have a quick look at saphenous nerve here. So you're looking at the medial aspect of a knee in the first picture on the left. You can see those nerves. There's infrapatella branches right below the kneecap. And that can get, uh, that is a very common cause of pain in patients who are diagnosed with patellofemoral pain syndrome. And certainly after surgeries and surgical insult and the clamps that hold the skin apart and stuff like that, the nerve can be stretched, compressed, injured. And this can even lead to a neuroma, which can have a much more complicated, um, you know, a much more complicated course of of you know rehabilitation and stuff like that and may ultimately require surgical incision or or ablation or something like that to resolve the symptoms. Okay. So in the picture on the right I like it because it's showing you know the the skin being pulled apart but you can imagine that nerve that it shows there what if that nerve was being pulled or compressed by the clamp and that's very easy to happen that's very easy to happen. Um <clears throat> Let's take a look at the distribution so we've got cutaneous, on the left side, we've got cutaneous branches of the femoral nerve superior to the knee. Right below the knee, we have the infrapatellar branch of saphenous nerve. And remember, saphenous nerve is a branch off of the femoral nerve. Okay, so if we're interested in saphenous nerve, we're interested in femoral nerve. And then we'd also be interested in where the femoral nerve comes out the back. So let's keep that in mind. And then as we get lower down the leg, we see medial cutaneous nerves, um, which are also branches of the saphenous nerve. What the picture in the left does not show well 
that the picture in the right shows a little bit better. The picture on the right, can you see how far those nerves are extending down the leg? They're going towards the big toe. And there's times when saphenous nerve can cause symptoms at the big toe or all the way from the knee to the big toe. So um, me big toe, medial foot, medial leg, medial knee, medial thigh. Um, yep. So there you go. There's some anatomy with regards to saphenous nerve. If we chase saphenous nerve up to the level of the back through, through the femoral nerve, right? And the femoral cutaneous branches, we're interested in those as well because sometimes those are giving symptoms. So we'll discover that second lumbar, third lumbar, and fourth lumbar levels are important to us. If a patient is having femoral nerve pain, saphenous nerve pain, we are going to need to follow that nerve all the way up to the back and see if there's something going on there. How can you check? We'll get into that in just a little bit. Some other things that can cause saphenous nerve tension. My, uh, macro trauma. So macro trauma is like a one-time trauma, like a contusion or a bruise. Someone takes a hit to the nerve. Um, repetitive micro trauma. So if you continue, to, if you find a movement that places tension on a nerve and you repeat that movement often, regularly, that nerve can become irritated. How does saphenous nerve get irritated or stretched out? Um, a valgus at the knee, whether it's a fixed valgus from a bony deformity or a dynamic valgus at the knee. In other words, patient does not have valgus at the knee until they perform a closed chain knee flexion exercise like squatting, single leg squatting, going up the stairs, going down the stairs. And we'll look at some photos in just a minute of what this looks like. But if there's a valgus or dynamic valgus at the knee, that will place stretch or tension on the medial knee on the saphenous nerve. And if that happens repetitively and the nerve is getting repetitively stretched like a rubber band, the nerve gets irritated and it can give us these kinds of symptoms. So posture, movement impairments. We spoke about the movement impairments. That's the, uh, the valgus at the knee, the genu valgus at the knee, either a static or dynamic. Okay. And by the way, you guys, um, if you have any questions as we're going along, we want this to be very interactive. I want you to have your questions answered. Ideally, we answer questions in real time. Sometimes I'll wait for a slide or two, but we'll definitely address any questions and want this to be as interactive and conversational as possible. So hopefully you guys have some good questions and, and we'll get some good answers today as well. So I wanted to touch a little bit more on the nerve injuries that can happen during a surgery. And when a patient is in hospital and something happens to them that causes issues for them, we call it iatrogenic. Iatrogenic is just a fancy word for it happened under medical care. It happened at the hospital. Okay. So I was looking through, I was updating this, this PowerPoint, putting it together. And I was, and I was wondering to myself, you know, what do we know about nerve injuries and incidence rates and stuff like that? And I didn't find too much about the incidence rates, but there are plenty, plenty, plenty of research studies that are, um, the, the medical world, the surgeons and stuff like that are very well aware that it's not uncommon for neurological insult to happen during surgeries and stuff. So we can see that iatrogenic nerve injuries can result from direct surgical trauma, mechanical stress due to faulty positioning during anesthesia. So sometimes the patient is not positioned well while they're out for the surgery. And um, sometimes there's injections of a neurotoxic substance by the nerve. There's plenty of other mechanisms. So damage during surgery, pressure or traction because of positioning, injection of neurotoxic substances, Compression via edema or maybe a hematoma, the tourniquet, the dressings, orthotic devices, um, you know, so in this case, maybe like a maybe like a knee brace or something like that, radiation, certainly. So, and this is a broad review that was done looking at research covering spanning from 1990 to 2012. So 22 years of studies and research. So very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about. Um, the movement dysfunction. And I think I have some photos. Okay. Let's come to this slide. 
And then we'll come back to the slide that we're on. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about a dynamic valgus. The patient does not have a bony deformity at the knee, but when they are performing closed chain activities, both legs or one leg, we get this squinting in of the knee, this valgus at the knee. Why? What's happening? There's a kinetic chain breakdown. There's pronation at the ankle. The hip is not stabilizing well. The external rotators, the abductors, right? Gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, the deep hip external rotators, um, superior, which are superior inferior gemellus, obturator internus externus, quadratus femoris, piriformis. There's a lot of muscles that are allowing this faulty movement to happen. And not only can it be a problem of weakness, but it can also just be the patient's preferred movement pattern. And we've got to change this. You see that knee, the patient standing on one knee? That is asking for a medial collateral ligament injury, a meniscus injury, um, ACL injury potentially, uh, saphenous nerve symptoms. And so when we have a patient, it doesn't matter if they're a high level cricket player, basketball player, athlete, or it's, you know, you know, your friend's uh, grandmother, it doesn't matter who it is. Like this kind of movement dysfunction is not okay. And we have to address it. We have to fix it. So how does this happen? Now let's come back to the slide that I was on. So how does this happen? <clears throat> so you can have it where it's a purely, purely a biomechanical issue. And the patient just moves that way, right? It's, it's natural for the patient to move that way. Maybe there's some weakness. Maybe there's some adaptation, some tightness. There's something going on that causes the patient to move like this. We would say that is maybe like a primarily just a biomechanical issue. So this, this primary bio, biomechanical issue where this is just a faulty movement pattern, this can be asymptomatic. Patients can move this way, but not have any problems. But they can also develop problems. They can develop pain and irritation, inflammation in certain tissues. And so in, in the case of a saphenous nerve patient, you can, they can have this, bio, this biomechanical faults, uh, these, this poor movement in the kinetic chain, and it can cause the neurological symptoms that we find, okay? Because the nerve is getting placed on stretch, right? The dynamic valgus at the knee is placing stretch, tension, on the saphenous nerve with each and every bend of the knee, okay? You can also have a secondary biomechanical issue. Follow me here. Okay, so let's say hypothetically that a patient has some problem in their low back around the L2, L3, L4 area, right? Maybe there's a disc herniation. Maybe there's a facet dysfunction. Maybe the pelvis is not level and it's causing increased, um, it's causing increased hypertonicity in the low back, whatever the case may be. Okay. So there's a problem in the low back, the lumbopelvic region. And we know that when there's pain and problems in the body, some muscles will become inhibited. Some muscles will become hypertonic. The muscles that become inhibited when there's low back pain and issues in the low back are usually the core, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, the hip external rotators, we named them. And when we lose power, a little bit or a lot of power to the hip abductors and external rotators, what happens? They don't stabilize the, the femur and the femur is allowed to internally rotate, which causes a movement dysfunction. Internal rotation of the femur will cause a dynamic valgus at the knee. It will cause pronation at the ankle. And so you can have a primary low back issue that's now causing movement dysfunction and or neurological symptoms in the leg, right? Okay. So in our physical exam, this is how I would usually do it, right? If a patient is describing um, burning, numbness, tingling around the knee, immediately I want to evaluate the nerve because those are consistent with neurological symptoms. So hypersensitivity, allodynia. Allodynia, the definition of allodynia is a non-painful stimulus that causes pain. Hypersensitivity 
is um, someone is just extra sensitive to stimulus, but allodynia is actually a non-painful stimulus, like just light touch or wind blowing that causes pain in the patient. Okay. And this can be there with, with neurological um, involvement. So I like to go ahead and palpate the nerve. So is there tenderness to palpation at the nerve, the femoral nerve, the saphenous nerve? And I want to check the, it's, it's easy if you, if you, push at the knee where the pain is, but you don't know what you're pushing on. There's ligaments, there's tissues, there's muscles, there's many, many things local to where the patient's pain might be. So if you want to check for the nerve, if you want to try to implicate the nerve or rule the nerve in, it's better if you can palpate the nerve that you think is involved above the knee and below the knee. And if you palpate it and it's hypersensitive and the nerve is thickened, or fibrotic compared to the other side, then you've got some very good information right there that's already leaning very strongly towards involvement of that nerve. We know that there's a problem there. It's just a question of, is this a primary nerve problem or is it a secondary nerve problem where we have movement issues and low back issues and stuff like that? So we do have a special um, adverse neural tissue Frank, tension test. Lower carina con. Sorry, if you don't mind, just muting yourselves, guys. We do have a special adverse neural tissue tension test for the saphenous nerve. So you guys know the straight leg raise test, right? Or, or ANTT tests for median nerve, radial nerve, ulnar nerve. So we have a test for saphenous nerve. I don't know how many of you guys have seen it before. Maybe everybody, maybe nobody. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Again, here's a picture of saphenous nerve. So you would want to be familiar with where the nerve is so that you can palpate it. And it's okay. Sometimes we have to fish along the whole leg up and down, back and forth until we find it. But trust me, if it's involved, you'll find it. This is our test for saphenous nerve. This is a modified slump test. So if you have a patient to perform a slump test and you put them in side lying position like this, curled up in a ball, why are they curled up in a ball? Because when you flex the neck, when you flex the thoracic spine, when you flex the lumbar spine, the central nervous system is wound up, right? The, 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 the spinal cord and stuff like that is, is, is placed at maximum length. And so we're taking up slack. <clears throat> if you guys don't mind just muting yourself, sorry. Okay. So as you see in the description here, what we do is from the patient being in fetal position, we take the test leg. We will extend the hip, abduct and externally rotate the hip. We will flex the knee and we will bring the ankle into dorsiflexion and eversion. And we hope to reproduce symptoms at the knee. We hope to reproduce symptoms at the knee. And if you reproduce symptoms at the knee, pain comes on, then you must have the patient you must move something or the patient must move something that's far enough away from the knee that when they move that thing and the symptoms change, the only possible explanation or reason can be that it's we've changed the tension on the nervous system. And that's why the pain changed. If they have pain at the knee and I move the knee, who knows what, what, what changed? Was it the meniscus? Was it the ACL, MCL, saphenous nerve? Who knows? <clears throat> but if they have pain at the knee, and then I move the ankle and the pain is better, worse with ankle movements. Now we have something, or maybe I might move the hip, or maybe I might even move the head, have the patient extend their neck once symptoms are reproduced and see if the symptoms change. This is an alternative test position that I've seen advocated in some literature and some, this was a source of contention for my previous mentor and myself, because I learned this first way and this way works for me. I've never had a saphenous nerve patient that has not uh, had their symptoms reproduced with this test. This is another way to do it. Um, if we're talking about, you know, the mechanics of it and stuff like that, I prefer this one because the femoral nerve crosses the knee joint. 
and the femoral nerve is where the saphenous nerve arises from. And so I believe that we can get better tension, better control, better winding up of femoral and saphenous nerve in this, in this manner. And certainly we can, in, we can introduce thoracic flexion and cervical flexion, which help to take up the slack um, from proximal to distal. But just be aware that this is an alternative position and you guys are welcome in your own patients and your own patient populations. You guys are welcome to try this one as well. This would be hip extension, abduction, external rotation. The knee will be extended. And then of course, at the ankle, we'll have dorsiflexion and eversion. So everything is quite similar, just a little bit different. Okay. So we did, we talked about doing palpation in our physical exam, palpation of the nerve. And then we want to check adverse neural tissue tension. What else do we want to check in our physical exam? We'd like to see how the patient is moving. I want to watch the patient walk. Are they having pronation? Are they having a dynamic valgus? Is the lower extremity internally rotating as the patient is walking, which means that the hip abductors and external rotators are weak? Is there a Trendelenburg? Um, and we want to watch them specifically with gait, ambulation, squats, stepping off of a six inch step or something like that, just to check the control at the lower extremity. Okay. Um, we also like to screen the hip. What's going on in the hip? Anything? The SI joint, is there anything going on there? And the lumbar spine, because something can be going on at one or all of these places. The longer the patient has had the symptoms, the more things are going to be involved because of kinetic chain breakdown and compensation and stuff like that. So the longer the patient has had symptoms, the more we expect to find. Here's our physical exam. We wanna see the patient squat on both legs. What does it look like? We wanna see the patient maybe do a single leg squat or maybe have them do a step down. And again, that indicates to us that the patient has a faulty movement pattern and likely they have weakness in the hip. Ankle pronation, hip external rotation, hip abduction, those things are weak. Um, we need to screen the lumbar spine, especially where the femoral nerve and ultimately the saphenous nerve originate from the low back, L2 through L4 segments. We can do PA springs, we can do segmental rocking, something to assess what's the mobility of those joints. Is it hypomobile or maybe it's hypermobile in a gymnast who's hypermobile or a dancer who's hypermobile or someone with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome who's hypermobile or someone who has a uh, disc injury and the disc is the primary stabilizer between two segments of the lumbar spine. And if the disc is compromised, that segment becomes hypermobile. And that can potentially create symptoms for a variety of different reasons in the nerve at that level. Um, typically in these patients with saphenous nerve symptoms, if you go and palpate the paraspinals around the L2, L4 area on the same side of the symptoms, the paraspinals will be hypertonic indicating there's a problem in the low back. There's guarding at those levels of the low back because there's something going on. We can check and see if the patient has directional preference. Maybe when we do repeated extensions, the knee pain reduces. I have had patients where we do repeated extension in standing or in prone, and the symptoms at the knee reduce, and even the gait pattern improves. Um, you could do repeated extension of the lumbar spine. You could do repeated flexion of the lumbar spine. We might even do unloading, like some decompression of the lumbar spine. Um, through different means, and that could improve the patient's symptoms as well. We want to evaluate these things. We want to see what's going to work for our patient because every patient may be a little bit different. So once we've evaluated all of these things and we know what's going on in the patient and we can treat them holistically, and maybe you don't get all this information in the first session, right? Maybe you just start at the knee in the first session and you do some local things to the knee there and then in second session, third session, you come up to the lumbar spine and to the pelvis. That'll be fine. It's difficult to get all of this information in the first treatment session, depending on how much time you have and how efficient you are and stuff like that. But ultimately, we would need to 
evaluate and, and treat all of these things. Because if you only treat the knee, but the problem is that the low back or the pelvis, ultimately you're wasting your time and the patient's time. So we need to be able to check these other things. Um, the goal of treatment, let's simplify this. The goal of treatment is to do what? Is to restore perfusion. In other words, blood flow, oxygen down the nerve so that it will become asymptomatic. That's the reason why the nerve has, that's why the reason the nerve is symptomatic. Nerves become symptomatic when they have decreased blood flow, decreased oxygenation, decreased perfusion. I've got a statistic for you guys. Okay. I've got a, a statistic for you guys, a clinical pearl. Nerves make up 2% of the human body. Do you know how much oxygen they consume? Do you know how much of the of, of, of our oxygen they consume in, in a percentage? Let's have a look. It looks like some action in the chat box. Okay. So nerves make up 2% of the body. They consume as much as 20% of our oxygen. That's a lot. Nerves are heavily oxygen dependent. And if they don't get even a little bit of oxygen that they want, they'll be they'll give you numbness, tingling, sharp, burning, shooting. Okay. So we need to restore blood flow, perfusion, oxygenation to the femoral and saphenous nerve. How can we do that? This is a sequence that you could do. We do a thoracic spine manipulation. Why are we manipulating the thoracic spine for knee symptoms? Because when we manipulate the thoracic spine, where the sympathetic nerve root ganglia are, we introduce a sympathetic neuromodulation to the body. If we manipulate the mid to upper thoracic spine, we create nerve changes in the upper extremities. When we manipulate the lower thoracic spine, we, we create sympathetic neuromodulation in the lower extremities. And there's plenty of cool studies that talk about um, the objective physical, physiological changes in nerves that happen when we manipulate the thoracic spine. So don't discount that. It's, it would be a, an important component. We want to give input to the L2, L4 region. And I say input because not every patient is a candidate for manipulation. If it's discogenic, you do not want to manipulate a disc. You don't, you do not want to do that. Um, but we need to give input to this area, whether it's manipulation mobilization, repeated movements, or maybe we do some unloading, some foraminal opening, some decompression, something like that. To the hip, classically, I will give a long axis distraction just to mobilize the hip, to reset the hip. SI and pelvis, that's a very deep rabbit hole. That's a very broad conversation potentially, but we'll talk about some of the common things that you might see in the presence of knee pain. So in the pelvis, when there's knee pain, most often we find anterior innominate rotation. There are some things there as to how you would determine that. Or the whole pelvis bone, the innominate, is in upslip, is jammed up on the affected side. These are things that can potentially cause knee pain as far as SI dysfunction goes. And these are the more common ones that would cause knee pain. <clears throat> How else can we call, can we create perfusion to the femoral nerve and the saphenous nerve? So if there's local tissue abnormalities, like maybe there's a portal site or an incision site, or the patient uh, has this scar tissue, whatever, we might need to do some scar tissue massage, some myofascial release, um, different things like that. Maybe some, maybe some cupping, you know, however you want to introduce soft tissue input using your hands is fine. Um, how else can we help out the femoral nerve and saphenous nerve? If there's a movement dysfunction, that valgus at the knee, that's causing this repetitive movement that's placing tension and irritation to the nerve, we need to correct that. How? Figure out which muscles are weak and strengthen them up. Usually gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, the deep hip external rotators, which I hope I will have time to show you guys how to distinguish those and how we would strengthen those. I think we'll maybe we'll take a break here in a minute and, and do some do some lab and demonstration on my patient. 
um, and take a look at that. So, and besides just strengthening the muscles, like maybe you'll strengthen the muscles on the mat using bands, using bridges, using clams, whatever. Don't forget that the ultimate goal for this patient is that what we're doing is functional. And I would say that bridges and clams, while they're wonderful exercises, it's not functional in the sense that it's not helping the patient improve their ability to go down the stairs. It's not helping them to stand up with better mechanics at the knees. It's not helping them to ride their bike with better mechanics at the knees or whatever the case may be. And so we have to do functional activities, whatever the patient does, whatever they're having problems with, stand up, sit down, kneeling, getting up off the ground, whatever the case may be. Okay. And then we've talked about some of these things. It's more important to strengthen what's uh, weak than to lengthen what's tight. So emphasis would be on strengthening the things that are weak. Okay. Because if, if all you do is stretch, then we're never getting stronger and we're never getting better. But stretching has a place. And so if there is um, some tightness or muscle shortness that you find, certainly we'll, we'll address it. Iliopsoas, adductors, piriformis, TFL. Um, those are commonly hypertonic and dominant when the other muscles are weak. Okay. Let's go ahead and I'm going to demonstrate some things for you guys with my patient. So the first thing I want to demonstrate is a dynamic valgus. Steven, if you want to come and just stand right here in front of the camera. And I'm going to have you put your legs far apart and I want you to squat and I want you to make your knees go together. That's a dynamic valgus. If someone is jumping or lifting or squatting like this, it's a problem. Um, did you guys know? So there's a very famous football player, USA football player from a few years back. His name was uh, Robert Griffin III, RG3. RG3, very famous football player. Peak, peak athlete, peak performance athlete, very famous in the whole USA, very strong, very fast. He was a quarterback. In other words, he was probably the most important player on the team playing for the National Football League. And there are photos of him. Go ahead and squat like that again. There are photos of him squatting like this, jumping like this. He is giving maximal effort for a vertical jump. And this was his squat. And you know what? He was he injured his knee with ACL injury twice and eventually was no longer able to play football. Go again. And we can see why he injured his ACL. This is a movement dysfunction. ACL, MCL, saphenous nerve can be beat up in these positions. So that would be called a dynamic valgus because my patient here does not have a valgus, but when he bends his knees, we see it. So that's a dynamic valgus. Could you do that on one leg for me? Dynamic valgus, here we go. Yeah, it's hard to do, right? Okay, there we go, that's good. And so that would be dynamic valgus. You can see it with single leg standing. You can see it with stairs, going up or down stairs. Mm -hmm, that's fine. Um, okay. Uh, another issue that we can see would be like a Trendelenburg. Can you stand facing that way? Hands by your side. Do you mind if we tuck in the shirt? Yep. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna simulate this one because I don't think that he has a proper Trendelenburg. Okay. But when you watch the patient walk, stand on your left leg, and if patient stands on his left leg and the pelvis drops to the right, the abductors on the side are letting go. That's your Trendelenburg, right? You guys know that. So just relax. So you can have the patient walk and you can look for Trendelenburg. Sometimes a subtle Trendelenburg is easy to miss. And so it's always a good idea to place your hands on the patient's pelvis and say, please stand on your left leg. And when he does so, you can feel the pelvis drop to that side. That's your Trendelenburg. Go to the other side. You feel the pelvis drop to this side. That's a Trendelenburg, okay? And a lot of times with lower extremity kinetic chain issues, knee pain, ankle pain, pain anywhere in this leg, um, it's SI dysfunction. It's very common that there'll be a noticeable or a subtle uh, Trendelenburg. And again, that speaks to um, potentially muscle weakness, perhaps muscle inhibition. Maybe the muscles are not weak, but there's something that's causing them to not activate properly. That's called inhibition. Um, just like after a knee surgery, patient has difficult contracting their quads because of pain and other things. 
Similar thing happens when there's pain in an area of the body, certain muscles shut down and other muscles become hypertonic and dominant. So the glutes, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, hip external rotators are commonly shut down, inhibited, and will need to be activated and strengthened. So, yeah. Steve, I guess let's have you come to this table here. The next thing I want to demonstrate for you guys is the saphenous nerve tension test. So let me move a few things. Okay. You want to come lay on your lay on your side facing me. Head right there. All right. Let's be patient. Okay, I'm going to show you guys from this angle, this view right here. TJ, Drew me, if the angle is not good or something, you guys just let me know, okay? Okay, so the first thing we're going to have our patient do is to curl up in a ball. Fetal position. Curl up in a ball for me, Stephen. Curl up in a ball. I want to make sure you have support under your neck, so let me give you this pillow, okay? Patient is in fetal position. We want flexion at the neck. Flexion of the thoracic spine, flexion of the lumbar spine. Why? Because that takes the spinal cord and it places it on tension. If I'm trying to detect neural tension, I have to maximally wind up the nervous system. Otherwise, you may get a false negative, right? Where the test says, no, there's no problem, but you did not do a good job and there is a problem and we missed it. We cannot be missing it. Okay. So then from this position, I'm going to take the top leg, which will be the test leg. And you have to check both sides. You have to check the good side and the affected side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hip and I'm going to place my hip behind his bottom. Okay. So that when I pull this leg back this way, just relax, relax, relax. relax. If I pull his leg back this way, I don't want his pelvis and his body to roll backwards. I want this pelvis and his back to stay stable. So I'm going to put my hip. I'll show you guys a different angle in a second. I'm going to place my hip behind his hip and my knee is on the mat. I'll show you guys that in a minute. We're going to grab this leg. I'm going to support under the knee because I don't want to hold it here and have a valgus at the knee. That can be very uncomfortable. So I'm going to support under the knee. Okay. We're going to bring the hip into extension, abduction external rotation. Okay. And I'm going to bring it back as far as it can go. Then I'm going to flex the knee and I've got the ankle in dorsiflexion and eversion. So flex the knee until we feel any symptoms. Ask the patient, do you feel any pain? Do you feel any pain? Do you feel any pain? Then the patient will say, I feel pain. Say, where do you feel the pain? It's that, and they'll say, that's my pain. That's that pain is at the knee. I'll say, okay, if I move your foot, into plantar flexion, if I move your foot, does that change your symptoms? Yes, it changes my symptoms. If I move it back into this position, dorsiflexion and eversion, does your symptoms come back? And they say, yes, that's one way to do it. Another way, once you've wound up the symptoms, and they say, oh, I'm having the symptoms right now. I'll say, can you take your head and can you extend your neck backwards? And say, does that change your symptoms? And they'll say, yeah. That changes my symptoms. I'll say, wonderful. We know exactly what the problem is. Okay. When it comes to neurodynamic testing, when it comes to neurodynamic testing, you have to be ready to fish a little bit. You have to be ready to tweak what you're doing and try some different things. You're trying very, very, very hard to implicate the nerve because you don't want to miss it. Okay. And there's many times, I wouldn't say many times, but in the lower extremities and with saphenous nerve and with the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, which we check for um, uh, Baxter's nerve, first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, we check that for uh, something that's masquerading as plantar fasciitis, but it's not. We talked about that last week. Um, in some of these nerves, these ones in particular, saphenous and first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, it's easy to get a false negative. In other words, the test says there's nothing going on, but you know there is because the patient has neurological symptoms. The patient has a thickened and fibrotic nerve. When you palpate along the course of the nerve on the affected side, it's tender, it's painful, it's thickened, it's fibrotic. 
And so the adverse neural tissue tension test, I want it to be positive, but if it's negative and I have enough information, then I will just let it be negative. And I'll say, I can tell that there's something going on with the nerve. So even if I cannot reproduce it with my adverse neural tissue tension test, we have enough other information to implicate the nerve and we should go ahead and treat it as part of what we're going to do for this patient. Does that make sense for you guys? Hopefully it does. Okay. Um, what else can I demonstrate for you guys? Okay. Yep. Steve, go ahead and lay on your back. Let me show you guys how I would palpate for saponous nerve. Here's how I would check. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we know the course of the femoral nerve, or we should. Femoral triangle. Okay. And then femoral nerve runs along the anterior thigh. And as we as it courses distally, it comes more medial more medial, more medial, until it dips under the long adductors here, just shy of the knee, okay? Just shy of the knee. And it's around here that the saphenous nerve branches off, okay? And so if I wanted to know if saphenous nerve and femoral nerve are irritated, I would take my fingertips, soft fingertips, mind you, you should, Curl your finger, you should um, always palpate using your lumbricals. So don't curl your fingers like this. You, you palpate using your lumbricals. So these muscles are engaged and your fingertips can remain soft, okay? So engage the lumbricals. And what I'm gonna do is I'll just start way down here, right? And I'm gonna do perpendicular movement because I know the nerve runs like this. So I wanna palpate perpendicularly to the nerve. So I'm going to try to roll over the nerve. And what we're looking for is like something that feels like a guitar string or a thickened rope. Okay. And nerves, once you start looking and palpating for nerves, they're easy to find. Okay. So I'll palpate. And when I feel something that feels thickened or fibrotic, or I think it's the nerve, I'll ask the patient, how does that feel? And they'll say, yeah, that kind of hurts a little bit. And immediately I want to come to the other side. And I want to check same thing on the other side. Does that feel same or different? And I try to put same pressure on both sides. Does it feel same or different? Okay. And it's going to feel different. So I've checked above the knee. And I'm also going to check below the knee. This is just me personally. I like to check if it's patellofemoral pain syndrome, we'll check the inferior branches. So I'm not even touching the patella, but we're checking inferior branches of saphenous nerve and there's tenderness and um, um, hyperalgesia or hypersensitivity, okay? Infrapatellar branches. I can also come down the saphenous nerve, which runs along the medial leg, and I'll start kind of at the bottom of the calf, and I'll just move anteriorly, palpating up and down, up and down. And then if I feel a thickened or fibrotic nerve or the patient reports to me, yeah, that's tender there, then that's important information, right? You can call this whatever you want to, tenels or just palpation of the nerve, doesn't matter what you call it. This is how I would go about checking. So if the patient has pain here and I find hypersensitivity, thickened fibrotic nerve here, hypersensitivity, thickened fibrotic nerve here, and then same thing in here, now we've got some good information about what's going on at this knee, right? Because the only thing that'll be tender from here all the way down to here and even further would be femoral nerve, saphenous nerve. And if we implicate that, as soon as we know there's a nerve involved, guess what? The treatment is no longer local to the knee, to the hip, to the ankle. The treatment has to extend all the way up where this nerve comes out of the back. L2, three, four. What's going on there? What's going on with the pelvis, et cetera, okay? So go ahead and lay on your side facing the camera again. We won't get into how do you treat the lumbar spine? How do we treat the pelvis? But I will show you after I have given input, manual therapy to the pelvis, to the thoracic spine for neuromodulation of the right sympathetic neuromodulation, 
to the lumbar spine and the pelvis and the hip. Once we've done all of that and I've, and I've cleared out the body, cleared out the body, we're left with this adverse neural tissue tension. And we should do some nerve glides. We should do some neurodynamics. So let me show you the nerve glide. There's two. There's one that the physiotherapist does. And then there's one that the patient can do at home. I'll show you both. So the one that the physiotherapist would do is just like, go ahead and curl up into a ball for me. It's just like the test, right? The, the neural tissue tension test. So I'm gonna take the patient. I'm gonna put them here, here, here. I'm gonna say, do you feel that right there? And the patient says, yes, I feel that. And at this point, we can either perform what are called tensioners, where we give very, very, very light tension to the nerve on and off. I usually tell my patients, I want you to feel it half out of 10 or one out of 10, almost nothing. And we can do tensioners. We could also do sliders. A slider is where as I tension the nerve at the knee, I let go of tension on the nerve at the ankle. So as we flex the knee, instead of bringing the ankle into dorsiflexion and eversion, I'll actually move the ankle into plantar flexion, okay? And then as I extend the knee, I'll, I'll put tension on the nerve at the level of the ankle. And what the research says is that the sliders, where we're not tensioning the nerve, we get a greater excursion and potentially better outcomes. But I would say that for this one, because it's, it, there's a lot going on uh, from a psychomotor standpoint, I usually just do tensioners but very, very light tensioners, like a 0.5 out of 10 or a one out of 10 symptom for the patient, okay? So that would be the nerve glide. And I would do maybe 20 or 30 reps, you know, one or two sets of 20 or 30 reps. How could you make the nerve glide even better? How could you make the nerve glide even better? What if I took his lumbar spine and we opened the neural foramen maximally, and decompressed the discs and the facets of the lumbar spine where these nerves come out and then do the nerve glide. That would be even better. Let's do just that. Steven, can you sit up facing the computer? I'm gonna take a rolled up pillow or a rolled up towel, sit right here, and I'm gonna place it under his waist on the unaffected side. And Steve, I'm gonna have you lay on your side over this pillow. What does the pillow here do to his lumbar spine? It takes his lumbar spine and it bends it. It side bends it, right? It side bends it. And so now we're taking pressure off of the discs on the affected side. We're opening up the neural foramen where the nerves come out on the affected side. And we are also taking pressure off of the facets. This is almost the perfect stretch or exercise to reduce symptoms of nearly any low back pain and low back pain with radiculopathy. It's almost perfect because it works in almost everybody, okay? Just lay, just even just laying like this. And you could do sciatic nerve here. You could do sciatic nerve glides like that. Or we can come and do the saphenous nerve glides, which is what I'm gonna do. So then we can come here and now we'll just do the same thing. Tension on, tension off, tension on, tension off. Steven, I don't want you to feel it more than a one out of 10. If you feel it more than a one out of 10, then I want you to tell me so that I can back off. Because if we go too hard on this nerve, it's, it, there's the potential that we can make it angry and it can have more symptoms. And I don't want that. I don't want you to have more symptoms. Okay, I want you to have less. Okay. Go ahead and stand up for me. Okay. This is a one hour lecture. And we are flying through great information. If you guys like what you're hearing, then you need to tune in to our full courses, which are all coming this year. Steve, if you will stand facing, I suppose stand facing the camera. We'll check this from different angles. I'm going to have you. Okay, guys, so let's say this is the affected leg. Right leg, this leg, affected leg. Okay. We're gonna turn the affected leg out to the side. We're gonna externally rotate it 90 degrees. We're gonna take a step forward with the unaffected leg. Bring your foot over here, I guess. Okay. We're gonna turn our body towards the front, towards the, towards the front, so like this. 
and then we're going to lunge forwards. Okay. Now I want you guys to see, and I'm going to show you very closely. The first thing we did is we externally rotated the leg. Okay. Just relax. Just stand there and come here. So if there's a string here, if there's a string here, that's the femoral nerve and saphenous nerve. If we externally rotate the leg, we have just created a little bit of tension on that string, on that nerve. Take a step forward for me. Now the hip is moving into extension. We're getting more tension on the saphenous nerve. If I rotate the hips this way, that's tension off. If I rotate the hips this way, that's tension on. Hands on your hips, lunge forwards. And when we lunge, we're creating more hip extension, which is placing more tension on the saphenous nerve. So on off. We'll want to do the same thing here. Tension on, tension off. Tension on, I want you to go to you feel it at like a one out of 10 and then come off. And we're just gonna just gonna do that. Um, 20 times, 30 times. And this is how the patient can do self saphenous nerve mobilization at home. And I know this looks different from the test we do on the table because the hip is an extension and the knee, sorry, the knee is an extension and not flexion, but it works. I can reproduce a patient's symptoms in this sideline position curled up in a ball. And I can also reproduce the same symptoms in this position. So it works. There's more than one way to get tension on this saphenous nerve, okay? So um, why don't we do this as well? I'm gonna show you guys quickly what I would do from a manual therapy standpoint, and then I'm gonna let my subject go for the day. Um, Steve, if you wanna come lay on your back. Okay, what did we say we would do from a manual therapy standpoint for this patient? Number one, we have found neurological symptoms in the lower extremities. That is an indication for lower mid, sorry, mid to lower thoracic spine manipulation. Let's do that. Steve, give yourself a hug. Any shoulder problems? Left shoulder. Left shoulder. You had a surgery there previously? Yes. Okay. How long ago? Uh, two years. Two years ago? Okay, it'll be all right. I'll be nice. I'm going to roll the patient towards me, hand under the spine, and manipulate, manipulate, manipulate. Okay, thoracic spine, done. Let's do the lumbar spine. Steve, can you lay on your side facing me? Facing me, sorry. Straighten up your bottom leg. Bend the top one. Let me have this arm. I'm going to twist you up. L2 through L4. So we want to get our tension. We want to maximize our force at L2, L4. So we'll lock out the lump, we'll lock out the whole spine down to L2, and we'll lock out the spine from sacrum up to L4. Hip, L4, right there. Everything is locked except L2 through L4. So now we're going to manipulate L2 through L4. Oh, nice. Already. Okay, other side. Straight up the bottom leg. And the top one. I see a lot of really sloppy technique on this manipulation and it should not be sloppy. You should use your body for the manipulation and not your elbow, not your pokey elbow in the patient's piriformis. That's no good. So let me show you how we do it. Roll the patient towards yourself. Get your chest on the patient's pelvis. And then all I have to do is just drop my body. One, two, three. Just drop my body. And there we go. Cavitation. Nice pops there. Clean technique. Gentle. Focused effort. Focused force. Gem is not trying to create people that are sloppy manipulators that don't have clinical reasoning that are injuring patients and they're having rubbish mechanics themselves and hurting themselves as physiotherapists. We demand a very high level of specificity. 
We want perfect technique that's comfortable for the patient. And we want a technique that is sustainable. So if you are doing manual therapy all day long for your patients, that you are not injuring yourself day after day. I know many, many therapists that have low back pain and other things like that. And part of it is sloppy technique when doing manual therapy. So we must fix that. Okay. So we did thoracic spine, lumbar spine. We'll do um, SI. Um, Steve, lay on your side facing this way. Bottom leg straight, top leg bent. Let me have this hand. So this is one way to manipulate a side joint, right? I'm going to engage the PSIS on this side. I'm gonna wind up the patient, use their forearm here to block their lumbar spine. Roll them forward, one, two, three, and manipulate, there we go. Lay on your stomach facing this way. That's one way to do it. If the patient has an upslip, we're gonna to have to do a different technique. If the patient's hip bone is jammed up, the hip bone is jammed up, then we'll need to do a long axis distraction. We'll have to distract it inferiorly. I'll hold the leg with my legs, block his sacrum right here, lean back, one, two, three, and manipulate. That technique can also be done with a partner, partner holding the sacrum while I give the leg a pull. Last but not least, go ahead and lay on your back. Two more things I would do for this patient from a manual therapy standpoint. One is a hip long axis distraction. We're gonna put the hip in the loose packed position, 30 degrees, 30 degrees, 20 degrees. Oscillate, 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 and when you're ready, Lean back and pull. And I actually felt distraction of the hip a little bit from the joint and felt it re-engage. That is a hip manipulation, grade five. Okay. And then after that, what we could do, I'll demonstrate on this leg. Usually by this point, soft tissue work is not even necessary. Okay. Usually by this point, soft tissue work is not even necessary, but you could take some massage cream, some coconut oil, whatever it is that you guys use, and just work those nerves a little bit, especially if there's portal sites or incision sites, or maybe there was some compression from some post-operative garments, wrappings, dressings, or a knee brace or a knee sleeve. So sometimes we'll get in and do some soft tissue work to try to free up the nerve from the tissue that's in there. Okay variety of things you can do. You could even do some dry needling, which I will not demonstrate, but we do teach dry needling one and two. You could do some dry needling. At the lumbar spine, you could do it. In the glutes, you could do it. And certainly in and around the nerve, we could do it as well to bring tissue perfusion and stuff like that. So we're going to continue the lecture, but I'm going to let my lab partner go. Thanks, Steve. I'll catch up with you later, man. Okay. All right, so back to the lecture, and we'll be wrapping up soon. <clears throat> Soft tissue work, right? We might need to address, we might need to address some ankle stuff. Um, ankle pronation, is it a problem? Yeah, it's a problem. What are the most powerful muscles that control pronation? I'll give you a hint. They're above the knee. The most powerful muscles that control pronation are above the knee, anterior tibialis, yes, it controls the arch eccentrically during gait. Posterior tibialis, the, the intrinsics of the foot, the toe flexors, yes, these muscles do contribute to um, controlling pronation at the ankle. But we know that when the ankle pronates, the lower extremity rotates inwards, okay? And so if it's rotating inwards, that means that the guys up top that prevent internal rotation are not doing their job. Who prevents internal rotation? It's the external rotators. Who are the external rotators? Gluteus maximus. The hip external rotators, the deep ones. That's superior inferior gemellus, obturator internus externus, piriformis, quadratus femoris, 
and we need to test these muscles and we need to know, are they firing or not? But if we can see pronation, we know that they're not doing a good enough job. doesn't matter how strong they are. Their strength is not enough. If pronation is happening, their strength is not enough. So that's interesting, right? Don't treat pronation only at the ankle. That might be like five or 10% of what the patient needs as far as strength, force, torque, control. <clears throat> home program. Okay. So once you determine what the deficits are for the patient, you will want to give them stuff to do at home. If they like flexion activities, give them flexion activities for the lumbar spine. If, they're, if they prefer extension activities like McKenzie's and stuff like that, you can give them that. You can have them lay over the pillow to open up their spine where the nerve comes out. Okay. So figure out what figure out what works for your patient and then give it to them for home program. Hopefully they'll do it. Some patients do home program. Some patients don't. If you can show them that it works, if you can show them why it's important and how it's going to help them get better and spend less money and less time in the PT clinic, they're more likely to do it. So sometimes we have to sell the exercise. Don't just give the exercise, explain it, sell it, educate the patient. We can give them this exercise where they put the foot back and they lunge forwards, right? I don't usually have them put their bottom of their foot against the wall, okay? Um, I suppose if your patient did not feel symptoms and then you did this and then they did feel symptoms, you could do that additional component. But I don't have many patients whose balance is that good, right? Especially if they're older. I might even have the patient hold on to a countertop, hold on to a wall while they're doing this exercise, okay? Give them the exercise. Open up the back and then mobilize the nerve. <clears throat> In addition to that, we might do some strengthening, some core training, some stretching. Um, if there's things that they're doing that can be irritating the nerve, we need to stop it. If the patient sleeps on their side with their knees touching all the time, this is compression to the nerve that we're trying to get better. And so if they're sleeping with compression on the nerve, do you think they'll have symptoms the next morning? Every day. How do we fix that? You can lay on your side, but I'd like for you to sleep with a pillow between your knees. That distributes the pressure, that distributes the force more equally, and we're less likely to get neural tissue tension at the saphenous nerve because we're trying to fix that. If the patient does some kind of Sitting with their knee in a valgus position, some people W sit, some people sit in the, in the desk chair with their foot wrapped around the leg of the chair, creating a valgus at the knee. And this can put tension on the nerve. We have to find out what is causing the symptoms. When do your symptoms come on? What do you do on a regular basis? These are things that you must avoid. You don't know how you sit. Next time you're at work, if you're sitting or driving, and you start to have pain, I want you to look at your leg and tell me what position is it in. And then you come back and tell me. What to expect. If you find saphenous nerve, adverse neural tissue tension, you should expect massive improvements in one to three sessions. Most of my saphenous nerve patients are done with physiotherapy in about three sessions. And they're all different. I've had saphenous nerve patients that responded to McKenzie extensions and standing. Pain was abolished. I've had saphenous nerve tissue tension patients where we open up the lumbar spine, laying over the pillow, and we do the nerve glides. And I give them the nerve glide for home. And after three sessions of doing this and, and, and PT, they're good to go. They're done. And they think you have worked a miracle because they came from the orthopedic surgeon that said, well, I don't know, maybe we'll have to have a surgery. You know, your imaging does show the knee has some wear and tear. You know, the, knee, the, the, the x-ray shows some arthritis, some degeneration. The MRI shows that you have some tear in your meniscus, but you have to correlate. You must check the imaging and it must match clinical symptoms because it, sometimes it does not. Sometimes you can have these findings on the imaging, but these are not what's giving the patient their symptoms. That's very common, very common. 
right? And as physiotherapists, we cannot just take what the doctor says, what the surgeon says, what the x-ray and the MRI say, we have responsibility to do our musculoskeletal testing. And if you feel like your musculoskeletal testing is weak, your differential diagnosis is weak, you guys should join us because we will make you experts. That's in the name, GEM, the global initiative to create expert manual therapists. Okay. We, today we spoke about regional interdependence. So I have this slide on there, right? Talking about the back, the pelvis, the knee, the ankle, and how it all plays together. This is always something that we will talk about because it's so important. You don't want to be chasing local symptoms when the problem is somewhere else. You guys are PTs. We know that. So I like to say, take off the blinders, right? The horse has the blinders, so he can only focus on where he's going. I have patients go to the foot doctor and the foot doctor only looks at the foot. He's wearing blinders. I have patients go to the knee doctor and the knee doctor is only looking at the knee. The knee doctor is wearing blinders. When we are dealing with the body, you have to address the whole kinetic chain. I like to call it the neurokinetic chain because not only is it a biomechanical kinetic thing that has movement, but there's nerves that run up and down this chain that control this chain, that give muscular strength, that give sensory input and, and, and carry signal back to the brain. So I like to call it the neurokinetic chain. And as PTs, you have to take off the blinders. We have to see the bigger picture from the top down, from the bottom up. So don't wear blinders when you have your patient. If you want to wear blinders for a first session and only focus on what they came for, that's fine. But you have to take off the blinders at some point. And when you do, you break free. And it's like, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, The Matrix. And when Neo, the, the, the main actor in The Matrix, when he wakes up and all of a sudden he can see everything in The Matrix, he can see everything. That's what it's like for a physiotherapist who takes off the blinders and is now evaluating the whole neurokinetic chain because you will find nerves cause so much of the symptoms, biomechanics, pelvic issues, neck issues, thoracic spine issues, rib issues. And we want you guys to catch these. This is what we teach. You guys, we have a cohort starting in 2023. It's our first GEM cohort. We're looking for people to join us. We are also looking for experienced physiotherapists, uh, distinguished physiotherapists to apply to our mentorship program. Um, physiotherapists that will go through our program, they'll get extra trainings and meetings with Dr. Singh and myself. And we are trying to groom the next generation of leaders in physiotherapy um, who can teach with us, who can take on students that have graduated from our cohorts and have them in their clinic and mentor them and show them and teach them. Dr. Singh and I had that. And it was, it was, life-changing for us. The education is wonderful, but the mentorship or the fellowship portion um, of what we hope to create, of what we hope to accomplish is, is massive and it'll change you forever. These mentors, of course, would potentially uh, be able to teach for us, would be able to house students and those things could potentially be income generating as well. So we're looking to help raise the next generation of leaders in physiotherapy, not just in India, in USA, in all over the world. I'm so glad that you guys joined us for this course. I'm going to be teaching it again in about four to six weeks to USA audience. And it's not going to be free for USA audience, but I'm glad that we could do it for you guys. I, I hope you guys, if you have any feedback, positive or negative, we'd love to hear it because we're always looking to better ourselves. We want to be clear. We want to be educational. We want to be the top of the top. I don't want you to go to another knee course, saphenous nerve course, better than mine. We want to create the best of the best of the best we have the educational background to do it. We have the experience to do it. We've been teaching online for three years and we've done uh, hands-on trainings as well in India. And hopefully, uh, not hopefully, we will, September, October of this year, Dr. Singh and myself will be coming to India to do hands-on trainings for dry needling, manipulation, muscle energy technique, neurodynamics, and many, many, many more things. So thank you guys for joining. Um, connect with us, you guys. Catch us on Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, 
uh, Gmail. Here's our contact information. If you guys are not following us on Instagram and Facebook, follow us because you'll hear about free lectures, opportunities, um, networking opportunities, and many different things like that when we're coming to India and, and whatnot. So join us, follow us there. And yeah, um, there's references. Dr. Singh, turn it over to you. Well, thank you for an amazing lecture. I mean, so as you guys know, we are offering cohort one, I mean, uh, applications for cohort one. And we're also looking for mentors across India because we want, we can't teach everybody and we want people to join us so they can take our message forward. I mean, we're potentially looking for two to three people from each zone, like North zone, South zone, East zone, West zone. So, and we'll be providing additional training. Me and Dr. Fort will be providing additional training, additional time outside, outside the usual cohort so that you can own your psychomotor skills, visual motor skills, and you can be, you can be part of a team. Okay. Anything you want to add, Dr. Fort? No, no. I really enjoyed teaching today. Um, you know, Dr. Singh and I, we're here for you guys. Honestly, we're here for PTs around the world. We're here for the patients. I want physical therapy as a profession to be elevated because we are the best. We are the best. Chiropractic, they only do popping and cracking, and sometimes they do it inappropriately. Acupuncturists, they do only the needling. What about strengthening? What about what the patient needs to do on a daily basis? We are the one-stop shop. This is a call for physiotherapists to improve themselves, to rise. This journey never stops. It has not stopped for Dr. Singh. It has not stopped for myself. We're continuing to better ourselves. And this is a call to action for physiotherapists. And I understand in India, actually, I believe that Prime Minister Modi was actually talking about physiotherapy not too long ago. And so it's it's a buzzword, you guys. We are, in America, in India even, I think that our prestige as a profession is slowly getting better. And we want to match that. We want to help drive that. We want to be the first place people go when they have pain and when they have problems, not to the pain doctor, not to the chiropractor, not to the acupuncturist, not for hijama cupping, right? It should be us, okay? So- Thank you guys for joining. If there's any, um, you guys are free to leave. If there's any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat box. If there's any questions related to signing up for our cohort, please direct them to the WhatsApp number or to the email address on this slide. Okay, super. I'll hang around for the next two, three minutes to answer any questions, but thanks again, you guys. You guys are free to go. We hope you'll join us at our next free lecture, which is next Sunday at this time. Dr. Singh will be teaching. What will we be teaching, Dr. Singh? It's a fun, fun topic. We're going to be talking about intercostal brachial neuralgia, which is very, very rare, but very interesting topic. So, Arm pain caused by a nerve dysfunction. People think they're having a heart attack. They go to the heart doctor. Heart doctor says, no, your heart is fine. The patient says, but why do I have these symptoms? And they go to everybody and they see everybody, massage therapist, everything, and they don't get better. And then they come to you. What are you going to do? Are you going to be able to help them? I had a fellowship professor who said, we, there are many, many, many conditions which physiotherapists miss. And these patients have seen you. The question is, have you seen these patients. You know what I mean? You have all had, I promise you, you've all had patients with intercostal brachial neuralgia, nerve pain in the arm that's coming from rib dysfunction. Do you know how to find it? Do you know how to treat it? Are you skilled enough to provide MET mobilization or manipulation needed to treat these symptoms? So that's what we're going to be talking about next session. It'll be very fun. And if you've never heard the term before, it's wonderful. It's a nerve that comes out between first, second rib and second, third rib, and then runs into the arm, providing sensory only um, input. So great, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Drumi, thank you for hosting us. We appreciate it. And Dr. TJ, thank you for your time as well. And we'll catch you guys at the next lecture. Cheers.